Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Bullock. I am a member of the Terry Third Thursday Alumni Board and am uh, co-chair of the Terry Third Thursday uh, Committee this year. Um, normally, you would see our dean at the podium, but he is on the road uh, today, uh, given his Terry economic forecast, and I think. Uh, Dr. Summercrist is uh, in Albany today, and he's in Columbus uh, tomorrow, so uh, he'll be back with us in February. So I'm standing in for him today. Um, first of all, just a little bit of business before we get to here to Kim Bay. Uh, our sponsors, again, for 2011, uh, Bank of North Georgia. Uh, we thank you again for being our, one of our great sponsors again. Uh, our media sponsors again this year, Public Broadcasting Atlanta and the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Do we have anybody here from those organizations this morning? We do. Again, we appreciate. <laughs> we appreciate you stepping up again. So um, our program, uh, 2011 is off to a great start. Uh, certainly excited to hear from Dikembe in a few minutes. Uh, additionally, we're going to have uh, John Crowley here on February 17th. Um, he was the gentleman per portrayed in the two 2010 uh, movie uh, from Harrison Ford, Extraordinary Measures. And uh, he's got a great life story to share for us. Uh, and then Lewis Miller on March 17th, who is the general manager of the, the new general manager of the world's busiest air, airport, uh, Hartsfield Jackson. Um, I want to remind everybody about our alumni awards uh, and our gala again. It's going to be April 16th this year. Um, and during the gala, uh, which is our big event of the year, we will introduce uh, our alumni award winners. And this year, uh, they are going to be Bill Douglas, who is the CFO of Coca-Cola, um, Andy Gertner, um, Executive Vice President of Cushman and Wakefield, and Miley's Nguyen, uh, who is with Weber Shandwick. Those are our, th our three uh, alumni winners that we're going to honor uh, this year at the April 16th event. Um, what I believe we're going to do now is we're going to begin a video that, uh, uh, and then I'm going to introduce Palmer Sanford. Uh, I may do that now, but uh, I think we're going to start the video and then Palmer is going to come up and uh, introduce to Kim Bay. Um, can't miss him. He's the tall guy down here at the front table. So, yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, Palmer, thank you for connecting us to Dikembe. Uh, it's an incredible story. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read the the bio, but I uh, couldn't be more excited to have Dikembe with us, and we appreciate that. And uh, uh, Palmer is uh, on our young alumni board, and is also uh, managed the manages the forward uh, Atlanta campaign that we have uh, with the Metro Atlanta Chamber. So uh, I guess now we'll start the video and uh, then Palmer, you can come up, so. I don't know where, it, I don't know where it's supposed to start from, but. Uh, From his earliest childhood memories, there had been civil unrest, poverty, sick and dying children in Dikembe Mutombo's homeland of Kinshasa. But even as a child, he knew there was a better way of life and believed that he would someday make a difference. My inspiration in life is always the changing of the living condition of my people anywhere in Africa. That's something I want to see. That's something I want to be part of. That's something that I want to see that happen. Not more, but happen now. Africa. 
Dikembe Mutombo is the seventh of ten children of Samuel and the late Biamba Marie Mutombo. I, I take a lot from both of my parents. Uh, my mom for just raising us when my daddy had to go to work. Uh, and then my papa is just a hard-working man who worked so hard in his life. The Mutombo family was built on a tradition of faith, education, hard work, and community. My mom she gave me a strong faith to believe that uh, do whatever you can do, as much as you can do. And God will give you more. I believe in that. I believe in that. It was this strong family foundation that paved the way for Dikembe to realize his dream of attending medical school in America. In his second year of college, coach John Thompson spotted the seven foot two inch Matumbo walking around campus, and after a successful tryout, offered him a basketball scholarship. And the rest, as they say, is history. Kembe Matumbo, what a star he's going to be. He's just learning how to play the game of basketball. He graduated from Georgetown in 1991. The man who had come to America to become a medical doctor was drafted by the Denver Nuggets shortly after graduation. His dominant style of play set the stage for Dikembe Matumbo to become one of the NBA's most feared and revered defenders. Blocked by the Kimmy, a tumble with three blocks in a row. In America, there are certain things that come to mind when talking about the tumble. But in Africa, it's what he does off the court that has made him somewhat of a national hero. With a population of more than 50 million, the average life expectancy in the Congo is only 47 years. Diseases such as measles and polio, which have long been eradicated in the Western world, still ravage its people. I actually witnessed 32 deaths in that village because of measles. Totally preventable. This disease shouldn't be around, period. You just uh I've seen people dying, dying in a young age. The few hospitals and clinics that exist in the Congo are unsanitary and ill-equipped to provide adequate health care. Children of the Congo are at greatest risk. One out of every five will die before their fifth birthday. When you, you are raised in this type of environment, your heart stay here. That's right. Whatever you accomplish in your life, your heart stay here. During the NBA offseason, Dikembe Mutombo and his money make an annual humanitarian mission to Africa. He supports dozens of charitable organizations, including this home for children with polio. <laughs> and this NBA orphanage that bears his name. He is actively involved in the fight against AIDS and has been instrumental in helping to establish the NBA's Borders Without Walls basketball initiative in Africa. He regularly sends shiploads of beds, medicine, and supplies to health clinics in Kinshasa. Still, he knew in his heart that he had an even greater calling. The call he received as a nine-year-old boy. Back in 1997, um, I've realized that uh, my dream of being a doctor is when I came to America to go to school. It's been taken away uh, from basketball. And uh, I thought to myself, I said, what can I do? He said, you always talk about being a doctor, but about building a hospital. And I just say, okay, let me start a foundation which the first goal would be to build a 300 bed hospital. In 1997, he established the Dikembe Mutombo Foundation, 
with the primary mission of improving the quality of health and education in the Congo. The General Hospital provides special care to Kinshasa's poorest residents and will be a state-of-the-art 300-bed teaching facility for Congolese health professionals. For the first time in its history, the people in the Congo have access to a modern medical facility, complete with the latest in medical technology, equipment, and medicine. Phase one of the Biamba Marie Mutombo Hospital was completed at a cost of $29 million. Dikembe personally donated more than $18 million and continues to work year-round to raise additional funds. In addition, he intends to provide enough backing for annual operating costs. That is why today he is campaigning to recruit 100,000 people to contribute $20 or more to become friends of the Biamba Marie Matumbo Hospital. I love my people so much and uh, love America, but I never forget home. You know, I never forget the place that made me to be the Kiri Mutombo. Help us take another big step forward. Please contact the Dikembe Mutombo Foundation or go online at dmf.org. Wow. Well, about four years ago, about this time of year, Dikembe Mutombo was a special guest at the President's State of Union Address, where the President praised Dikembe as a person who had never forgotten his native land, who had worked tirelessly to raise money for a new hospital in his native Congo, the first new hospital to open in the impoverished nation in 40 years. We're honored today to welcome this most caring athlete, as he is named by one national, national magazine, Dikembe came to the United States on an academic scholarship to study medicine at Georgetown University. And as you saw in the video, Georgetown coach John Thompson famously found the seven-foot Matumbo on campus and asked him to try out for the basketball team. Um, Dikembe, I would say that worked out pretty well for everyone. <laughs> After a stellar collegiate career, Dikembe was drafted by the Denver Nuggets, and throughout his 18 seasons in the NBA, he was named NBA's Defensive Player of the Year four different times, for his career, he was second all-time in block shots. And as an NBA All-Star eight times, he finished his career in 2009. But his work has hardly slowed down. Even during his career, Dikembe was dedicated to improving the health, education, and quality of life of the people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He spent many off-seasons traveling throughout Africa on behalf of the NBA and as a spokesman for the International Relief Agency CARE. In 1997, he created the Dikembe Mutombo Foundation, which is working to eradicate many childhood diseases that are still life-threatening in many parts of the Congo. It was through this foundation that the new hospital that I mentioned earlier and we saw in the video was funded and built. The hospital is named for Dikembe's mother and provides care to thousands of patients every year. When Dikembe retired from the NBA, he decided to settle here in Atlanta with his wife Rose and their three children all of which I'm recruiting to someday attend UGA. <laughs> uh, I've known Dikembe through various civic organizations such as the Chamber, and I'm still begging him to take my wife and I on one of his trips to Africa, um, but it's my pleasure to introduce him to you today. So please join me in welcoming Dikembe Mutombo. Morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Pam, for this warm introduction. Good morning, dear friends of the University of Georgia, Terry College of Business, alumni, faculty, students, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to be here with you, although that I'm a little bit tired. As an NBA Global Ambassador, I'm traveling more than I did when I was playing basketball, but it's all good. 
I'm at Stanford, and I you have been good friend for quite some time. So I'm so delighted when he asked me to come and speak at you the third, the third Thursday breakfast meeting. I cannot sufficiently thank you, Palmer, for inviting me here today because I feel particularly fortunate to have this opportunity to speak at the Terry College of Business. I must confess that I almost got lost this morning thinking that I was going to speak at the University of Georgia in Athens. <laughs> but thanks God for my office staff who remind me that uh, you were still in backyard, <laughs> which where I live. <laughs> I never forgot how good I felt when I learned that uh, I would be among one of the distinguished guest speakers at the New Year's to speak at this breakfast meeting. As you kindly invite me, it was not on my nature to refuse. I would like to know that um, I'm very absolutely at home here, not a mother stranger. To the student, I'm recall very distinctly the journey that I took to get where each one of you is here today. I remember my first day when I arrived at the University of Georgetown campus in Washington, D.C. It was the beginning of my new life, the new journey in America, so where I was able to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity that was given to me to obtain the first rate education. I vividly recall the time of snow in Washington. As you might know, Growing up in Africa, where there's no snow at all, except in Kilimanjaro, Kenya, or some part of South Africa, where I experienced the snow last year during the World Cup. It was funny, because everyone in the dormitory came out to, to my door yelling, African, African, <laughs> wake up, come see the snow. But after living and experiencing the snow, as we did here last week, there was nothing again I cannot remember for what I experienced. <laughs> Loving college campus to, to these days represent a wonderful freedom. Although much, much hard work, determination, and self-discipline is required to finish college with a degree then go on to the graduate school, like many of you are persuading here, there's no much that uh, we can take for granted. Freedom of choice is precious. Even if it's only exciting in making the decision to go to the class or not, to do homework or not, or to go to a party, even as important is the freedom of expression. Here in America, we are used to express our thought and opinion with a fear of retribution. This is not the case as many countries where students suffer, even, even lost their life because of what they say or what they write. As I refer to one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, Jr., the function of education is to teach me to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of a true education. As many of you know, I place a tremendous value on education. You see where I came from, education is not free. In the Congo, the annual school fee by child is like $65, and the average annual income is $140 to support the entire family. My dad, who was a, a teacher for 37 years, made only $38. You might also know that the less than 1% of the world population, you have the opportunity, in Africa particularly, you have the opportunity to attend college. Besides that, Dr. King quote, 
translate to the value that my father Samuel Mutombo, a retired teacher and school superintendent, and my late mom Biamba Marie Mutombo, a homemaker and Sunday school teacher, installed in me and my siblings. I can easily recall my experience at Georgetown University when I came to this country with a little bit of English and spent five hours a day taking English classes and in order four classes so I can keep up with my 12 credit of the academy scholarship. It was not long after meeting the big John, as we call him, John Thompson, at McDonald's gym when I realized that my life would take a different direction, an expectedly direction that will eventually bring me to the place where I am today. I didn't know at that time, but it, it did help me to achieve the dream of playing basketball in National Basketball Association NBA for more than 18 years. Your journey, as you are today, will take you during some of the hardest economy time that our country you have not faced since the Great Depression. But, my friends, the world is getting smaller every day, and there are other challenges that we all might face in this world today. This past week, we celebrate the birth of Dr. King Jr., who taught us about the service to order. After a successful career in the NBA, my way of serving order was to build this, as you saw in the video, this new 300 bed hospital in my homeland, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm happy with the service that I'm providing to the people of the continent of Africa. Since the Biamba Marie Mutombo Hospital, opened his door three years ago. We have treated more than 65,000 patients, especially women and children, for free. This translates to one of my lessons that I share with each one of you in this room today. Despite our success in life, our eyes cannot be closed to the pain and suffering of all the people around the world as one of the doctors from Botswana caught it during the AIDS, World AIDS Conference in South Africa in Durban. If there's a problem affecting one part of the world, it should be a responsibility of any human being living in this planet. You don't have to be famous, like the Kemi Mutombo, or build the pyramid, or be a Nobel Prize winner, but you can make a difference in your everyday life with your family and your community. For some of us who are Christian, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So when you leave the Terry College of Business today, what you are going to do to make a difference? Before I close up to this morning, I would like to thank my family for their unconditional love and support that they have given to me over the years so I can continue to do what I've been doing in my life. As you move on in your own journey, do not forget those who continue to suffer around the world especially in Africa and Southeast Asia. My accomplishment taught me the creation of this foundation which bearing my name, the Dikemi Mutombo Foundation, which is based here in Atlanta, which is just an example how one person can make a difference in life of people around the world. I wanna thank you for waking up in the morning and coming to listen to me. 
and God bless you. You know, I calculated, I think Dikembe is exactly two feet taller than I am. <laughs> Not two inches, but uh, at this time we'd like to ask questions, and uh, if you'll raise your hand, um, they'll bring you a mic so we can hear you. So, thank you. Do I have any questions? Hey, Dikembe, um, could you tell us how do the patients pay for their care at your hospital, or or is do they pay? Um, right now, uh, we have treated more, um, as I call it, more than like 65,000 um, women and children. Uh, the average um, treatment is like um, $10. And uh, as you know, more than... Um, 1.3 million children in Africa are dying every, every year because of malaria, which is the number one uh, deadly disease that is taking a lot away from so many kids in Africa. And um, the treatment costs like maybe $7. But when you look at it, it's just late by the time the parents are bringing their children to the hospital uh, where the, um, the virus already have to reach the brain sometimes uh, taking a life away for so many kids. Uh, we are trying to treat those who can pay and those who cannot pay. It's not really, um, it's not really a free clinic, but we are asking the population to contribute. Even you can give $2 or $3, so that way we can have the balance of uh, 1.3, 1.4 million dollars to, to for the, our operation budget. It cost me about 1.4 million dollars a year to just keep the hospital going. And when you look in America, where the hospital costs a billion dollars just to keep. Uh, um, uh, in my country, uh, where I came from. Nurses make only one hundred and twenty-five dollars a month, so it's really it's, uh, you might think it's nothing. It's like you paying a, a drink or food in a restaurant somewhere in Roof Chris or something. But uh, that's the cost of living in the Congo. Then uh, doctors, average doctor, make five hundred dollars a month, and uh, we are trying to pay our doctors um, a good salary so they don't have to steal medicine or start treating the patient outside the hospital. So we try to pay them maybe 2,000, maybe four times that the government is paying its doctors. So make sure that they work a 12 hour shift and they don't have to leave it. It's not easy to have more than uh, 420 doctors or nurses under your hands, especially in being young as I am. So. <laughs> Feel free to ask me any question. Um, I go around and speak a lot, almost every week. Good morning, Mr. Tambo. Good morning, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, what what type of support do you get from uh, your colleagues or your fellow colleagues in the MBA and, and, and others? <laughs> Good question. Um, how do I ask? How do I ask your question? Which way you want it? Um, <laughs> It's been sad and disappointed. Um, I don't know. Um, as an NBA global ambassador, it's just, it's been difficult for me to describe the situation. I've been trying to study the way I can come up with the answer. Um, it's been almost 13 years that I've uh, built this uh, foundation, which was a uh, to go in and let my dream come alive. And I've seen maybe five or six players out of uh, 480 players that play in the NBA every year who have contributed. Um, 
But that they have not discouraged me uh, to accomplish my dream. Uh, I've been lucky, as I call myself, being um, then you have a chance to reach out to the American public and uh, to find a way to get money for the hospital being built before um, and to get the money uh, to keep the hospital alive. We, we have raised, um, before the hospital opened, we raised more than $10 million. Mostly what I do, um, meet people like you in this room, and I tell you my life story, and I tell you where I came from. And that's how it goes. You know, people donate based on their heart. Um, as, uh, as you saw in the video, we ask people for starting at $20. Some people want to do 20 some people want to do 100 whatever. And we have people that gave us a million, half a million, as you goes on, but more than you do that, you put it together. But I never try to count on the basketball players. Uh, if you want to know, let keep that in our room, in this room. Uh, <laughs> I don't wake up in the morning and try to say, okay, I'm going to get my money from the basketball players. Uh, uh, that doesn't even cross my mind. Hi, my name is Moyesola Alasene, and um, I wanted to know what has been the most difficult um, part of your journey in starting your foundation. I think uh, the most difficult part of, um, it was easy to, you know, to follow the paper here in Georgia government and trying to get everything going for the foundation. A difficult part was uh, when I thought so many things in my mind that, okay, it was going to take six months uh, to raise all the money, and I just was going to go to all the basketball players, like my, my friends here asking me. I said, man, come on, Tracy, come on, Joan. You give me 100, you give me 50. And I went there, everybody was like, oh, come on, Dick, what's going on? You make money, we don't have to give you no money. So. When I hear the answer everywhere, right away, when I knew that uh, what I was about to do, it was not going to be easy no more, that I need to leave the area that I was operating in. Um, another difficult part that, uh, for any one of you guys who want to go to, uh, to a philanthropic work, know that uh, it will take a lot of time from you and from your family uh, also, you need a lot of dedication from your own part and not a lot of resources for you to do anything you want to do um, outside this room, uh, helping the poor. It's not easy. You have to be passionate about it. Because if you don't have a passion, please don't do it. That's my best advice. Anything you want to do, uh, if you want to start going to uh, a mission trip or something. But if you don't feel like uh, somebody is pushing you, just don't do it. Do it because your heart is telling you so. Uh, I do this because it's me. It's nothing else. It's just me. It's, it comes naturally. Uh, that's how I was brought up. Um, but it's not easy. You know, uh, sometimes your wife and kids are there. They say, Daddy, where are you going again? Uh, son, I gotta go raise money for a couple of days, I'll be home. And so it's not easy. Um, I travel a lot to raise money. Uh, this past um, four days, I've been on a plane six times. You know, just trying to raise money. That tell you, you go city after city because you have to, you have to reach your goal. You don't have no choice. You have to go. And, uh, and uh, you have to be articulate how you t talk to people. Because sometimes you can turn somebody off right away the, as soon as you start your speech. You got to know how you're approaching somebody to make sure that he open his wallet by the time you finish speaking. <laughs> he, uh, uh, I don't walk in a room and say, hey, excuse me, good morning, my name is the game Mutombo, uh, can I have $200 from you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to you if you know I have it. 
Chris, you got to tell me some story. You got to give me some numbers, some statistic, you know. Uh, when you're telling somebody that I'm from, from the place where the life expectancy is like 45 and 47 for women, and the way my people have perished because of, because of this pandemic of HIV AIDS, which have destroyed the fabric of our society, they have killed more than uh, 30 million people so far and left more than 20 some plus million people living with the virus in Africa. You, know, you tell people how many children in Africa today, more than half a billion of children in Africa on the age of 15 are orphans. They don't have no parents and they don't know where the future hold on them. And you tell people, how's the continent itself? You know, you have more than uh, almost uh, 800,000 children on the age of 15 years old, which is the youngest population in the world today as we live there. And you talk about all those uh, diseases that are killing them. But if you don't do it, my sister, you're not going to get no money from nobody. Uh, those are some of my lessons. You know, they might not teach you that in graduate school, but uh, <laughs> those are the lessons you learn in life. Yes. Definitely. Um, like a couple of weeks ago, we just installed the, the third CT scanner in the continent of Africa, um, 64 slides. So that tell you just where I see my continent going and uh, what kind of change I'm bringing to the continent of Africa. Um, I'm very deeply, not just, I don't see myself as a Congolese, I see myself uh, just a proud African descent. And um, I take a chance, whatever I can do to make my continent move forward. Uh, I wish I was in politics where I can do other things, but I'm more in a philanthropic world where I can carry the message in the best way. But our hospital is open to to people from uh, all of the Central Africa. We are very getting patients from Central African Republic who are coming, seeking treatment. From Congo Brazzaville, we have so many patients across the water. From Angola, um, a lot of people are coming from different, especially from the East. Uh, we just start uh, operating on women that have been raped. As uh, you know, Congo has been in the spotlight for uh, for allowing more than 50 some plus thousand women that has been raped uh, in the east of Congo because of the violence uh, and the civil arrest there, uh, which is, uh, they have a lot, lot negative impact uh, in the country itself right now. And uh, we've been treating those women, we are praying by 10 to 15 women a week right now from fistula repair which is a big problem right now because you have some of the ladies that have been raped by 10 men or 50 men. And we are trying to find a way, how can we fix those women? We cannot heal them spiritually, but just give them hope to go back into society. And those are the things we are doing. Um, I wish the time was allowed really to give you a more deeply statistic and all the stuff we're doing in, in the hospital is we're reaching up across the board. Uh, our city scan uh, now, we are reaching up to all of the countries in the continent. To see the continent of Africa, you have more than uh, 57 countries. Um, only three city scanners. You know, you talk about more than a billion people living in the continent. You know, in Atlanta, you go to Northside or St. Jude's, I think they got more than four city scanners just in one hospital or you drive down the street on Pima, they might have about five of them. But in Africa, you don't see it, you know. I, I come from the continent where hospital is considered as the road of no, no point return. I mean, when you tell somebody, oh, my mom is in the hospital, and somebody will go, oh, is there anything I can do? Is she gonna come home ever? So. 
it's, it's mentally, people believe that if I go to the hospital, I'm never going to come home no more. And it's just a uh, road of death. And uh, we hope that we can give people the hope that you can go to the hospital, seek treatment, go home again. And that way, I want to be part of that change. I want to see that in the continent happen. My name is Irene Kirika. I'm from Kenya, so I can directly connect with your experience. My question is, we talk about brain drain from third world countries to first world countries. Do you experience the same thing with the nurses and the doctors that you have at the hospital? And the reason I say this, do you get the backlash from the government? Because you're paying them four times more than what the government pays the regular nurses and doctors. That's a good question. Um, you know that happened. Um, if you know that the government is the one who gave us the land, the government who gave us the permit, um, we get a tax break from the government. Uh, right now, the same government feel like you're making them embarrassed. You embarrass them every day. Uh, those are the problems that uh, we're facing in the Congo. When I'm in Kinshasa, nobody talk. And no government people come to my hospital even uh, challenge my employees. That only when I leave, you see all those inspectors and everybody just come. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the Church of Christ, uh, the Jehovah, uh, the Mormon Church from Utah, I have decided that uh, they want to make a change in Congo as well. So they gave uh, the gave us money to build the well. They built for us. They paid this big company. They put a big well in the hospital. So we don't have to keep spending thousand, thousand dollars a month and paying the city for the water supply. Lately, we're getting challenged by the government now saying, hold on, you're not paying your water bill. How come we say we're not paying the water bill because we don't need no more water <laughs> from the city? <laughs> and uh, we build our own water uh, plant at the hospital, and uh, we're treating our own water, so everything is done at the hospital. And then now the city say, no, but you're taking the natural, uh, the natural resources of the country, so you owe the state some money. I say, what? The rain come from the sky, and how do I owe you money? <laughs> so... I'm leaving for Congo in two weeks, um, on the 14th, on the, no, on the 4th, to go to Congo with a bunch of group of doctors from Pima Hospital to do more surgery on women. And uh, that, that's what I'm planning to go meet with the president and meeting with all the ministers to see uh, how far they're going to take this the discussion um, about finding a way to get some money from the hospital. They do forget already. We have given treatment to more than 60 some plus thousand women and children for free. And whereas the one from the came in Mutombo, I think um, they don't see my hospital, all they see, oh, this is a big basketball player who are playing the NBA, made million, million, million dollars. Oh, he got money, we can get some over there. And, uh, so that they target. Their target is more my pocket than the hospital. And they think they can get some, but usually they don't get nothing. Rotimea <laughs> uh, Konyo, how have the lessons and the qualities you developed on the basketball court prepared you for uh, your philanthropic activities and also leading your organization? Um, I think my experience uh, just being a self-discipline, which I developed about uh, well, during my career of 18 years. Playing in the NBA is not easy. Because every day you wake up in the morning, you know that uh, am I going to make it to the bus or the phone is going to ring while I'm eating breakfast and somebody's going to tell me that you are not in the team no more. That's the challenge that I live in on my life. You might see some of the players today driving nice car, all of that, but the life you see is not really the life that they're living in. We do live uh, life under the box, under the pressure. Um, that you might not have the life you have in tomorrow or in a second. The 
because you are challenged with the trade, you are challenged with a thousand, thousand kids who are coming outside from college every day. Who wants your job? You know, there's 480 jobs in the MBA. And um, every year, 200 people have to lose their job. So for you to stay in that circle for 18 years, you better pray every, almost every hour. <laughs> and, uh, um, so if you don't find a way to get to your knees down, just pray that, uh, okay, let me finish this month or next month. You know, that discipline of being able to make practice on time, uh, don't piss the coach off. Um, you have a good friendship with your comrades on the team, and um, be a good friend to the media, and um, also practice a little bit of politics. You know, when you're a basketball player, you have a chance to be a voice for so many causes, and uh, by by doing so you can go and becoming an advocate and build a good friendship for so many people, politicians, uh, business people in your community, and reach out to the poor where you're playing basketball, even though you're going to be there for a year or two, and just try to expand yourself. And that's what I did. Everywhere, every city or every team that I did play in, I developed a good friendship with almost, first of all, I used to try to meet Everybody used to live in the cold side. We used to season ticket holder that staying on the cold side. Those are the people who pay big bucks to the team. They pay thousand, thousand dollars. Then you do a little bit of, you Google them. You know, you do. <laughs> you do a little bit of homework. Who's that guy who always sit on that chair and that one? You try to know those rich folks that come in the game. You want to know their life. You want to know the name of their wife the name of their children, um, the company they work, and maybe one day you run up to them, excuse me, Mr. John, how you doing, man? I heard your company doing very well, man. That's a wonderful job. Man, how's your wife, by the way? How married? You go in that conversation. When you leave that space, that person stay like, oh, how did can we know even my wife, my children, <laughs> our company as is doing? I think these kids just play basketball. It's much smarter than that. And you leave that impression. And a couple months later, when you come and say, hi, John, how you doing, man? I think, did you hear about my foundation? <laughs> do you think? <laughs> you can you twist the conversation a little bit. You say, there's any way I can come to your office even for five minutes. I would love to talk to you more about what I'm doing. By the way, your door is open. Oh, please call me on my cell. Don't go to my secretary. You know, right away, you, you right away, you got a freeway. And then uh, you get there, uh, and um, that's what I've developed, really, to get the money so I can serve all of those women and children who are dying in Africa. Well, it's a good lesson. Is, uh, you just have to develop the chemistry because those things, they don't teach you that in school. You know, uh, like uh, my coach used to say, Dikembe, you might be a basketball player. You got to make sure you have a business card. Even just say Dikembe Mutombo. doesn't have to say Dikembe Mutombo, NBA, Houston, Rocket, or no. Just say Dikembe Mutombo and your phone number and the email. But every time you meet somebody, you give them the number and you take a business card. But so many of you guys, you take business cards from people, but you never write nothing behind the business card. Because every time you go home with your suit, you change your suit at home. But you might go, oh, I met this guy, okay, I'll call him later. But you don't know how a brain works differently. It's always good. You meet somebody, you put the, oh, yes. Met him. I know that I met him in June 20 at the Terry School of Business in Georgia. You put something behind a business card. That way your mind can be fresh. That way the day you will send him an email, you know where you met that person or the day you want to talk. You don't want to have a bunch of business cards stuck in your office. You start going, where did I meet this guy? <laughs> Who is he? You start looking because, you, you know, those things, they don't teach you that they're school. It's the thing that you just pick up by yourself as life goes on. And uh, I learned so many things from people. And I think uh, Coach Thompson, you know, who, who I look at my, as like a father figure, he plays such a big role in my life. And uh, they 
thing that he, he translated to me and gave to me, um, I think is uh, some of the best uh, lessons of my life. And uh, I think uh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that uh, I have, yeah, have so many wonderful people walk in my life and I took the advice and uh, I went there to make it in practice. Yes. Well, I was just gonna ask, you know, it's interesting how things happen in life and it changes your, your whole life. And have you ever thought about where you would be today if Coach Thompson had not thought to come up and approach you about playing basketball? And how much basketball experience did you have at that point? Um, Cause I don't know where I would have been. Maybe being in Africa somewhere, uh, selling bread in the market, or, or working in one of the hospitals making five hundred dollars a month, for like uh, the rest of the doctors, uh, with the passion that I did have in serving others. But I didn't play basketball until I was a sophomore. So. First, I, I hate basketball so much when I was young. <laughs> Tell you the truth. My, my brother played for national team like for 10 years. My youngest brother was playing in a Division II national team. Um, my sister was playing on national team. Uh, I'm the seven of 10 children. And uh, I have all this and younger. Everybody was almost like on the national team. And I just hate basketball. Uh, even in school, I didn't just want to play. Uh, I tried the first time. My brother and my dad forced me to play my junior year in uh, high school. And the uh, first time I went to practice, I was like uh, 16 or 17 years old uh, because I was so weak and soft. Uh, I was tall and skinny. And, uh, and my brother and the coaches, they had me jumping the rope and all that. Next time I knew, I would have me jumping the rope back and forth, and I just fall flat. And um, I cut my chin. If you look at me here, you can see I have a big scar here. That was my first day playing basketball. I had to get about 22 stitches. And uh, from then, I said to my mom, tell daddy I don't want to play no more basketball. No. <laughs> and uh, my, my mom used to be a big uh, backup uh, for me. And, uh, even though she was a strong woman in the house, she just uh, told my dad and my brother to leave me alone. And nobody really didn't bother me. Everybody was like, okay, he will play basketball one day. Then I came to the U.S. And when Big John is big he is, when he walked uh, there, you know, with his tower and his shoulder, he said, so, Africa, what are you doing? I said, Who's this guy that tall is uh, talking to me? He so, said, I'm Coach John Thompson. You're going to play for me. I said, play for you. You know, it's just, it was, I, I got scared. I was pushed by his fear. You know? <laughs> and then uh, my sophomore year, those who know my career, I really play only five minutes again. You know, I was like uh, the 13 guys in the end of the bench. It was until one day we was playing, I think it was like a 10 in the middle of the season, we was playing St. John. And Alonzo Money got in the far trouble. It was like a 10 minutes going into the game. He had already three far. Um, Coach Thompson didn't know what to do. He almost lost his mind. This was Alonzo, a big, big televised game on national TV. And uh, the eyes was on Alonzo because Alonzo was considered to be um, the next Moses Malone, somebody who would have gone to the NBA from high school. All those kids are going to high school today is just their new history. But those guys who made history really was uh, Moses Malone and Alonzo was going to be next. But they ended up going to John, um, to Georgetown. And he could come to look at the bench and say, oh, Africa! Come here. I was like, whoa. <laughs> then he, I walked in and he said, look, you going to serve us today. You are. And I want you to go there. Do not score. I don't, I, I don't even want to see you even trying to dunk or nothing. Do not score. Just get a rebound and block shot. I was like, whoa. 
It's the first time I've ever played. Now they're putting me in the spotlight. And then I got in the game, like 60 minutes late, I broke NCAA record. 12 block shot. Like in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> And uh, everybody was like, who is he? So people was like, the stadium went crazy if you look at some picture from Georgetown. So a student started putting the fingerprint in the Georgetown uh, a band. They have a little bit of uh, a rap in the front of the student section. They start putting their hands up. Blocks. And everybody was like, who is this guy? Who is he? When did he play basketball? When did he get here? So even the guys from St. John, they didn't know who I was, because many guys never see me playing. And uh, I was a new fan, a new secret, a new. And from that day, my life changed. You know, I went from to be nobody. Next time I was a superstar in America, I broke the record, NCAA record, single game, all season. Then I went into becoming a block shot champion in college, and uh, my life had becoming history because it took only one game. Sometime in your life, your chance can be become one time, and it take only one action. And uh, we see it. We see it no long time ago in Tucson when the Congresswoman uh, Rafe was shot. It took one, the courage of one young man who was just an intern to take his fears away from his mind and to rush himself during the tragedy and to go and save the life of a congresswoman. And that's all I'm asking you. You know, you might think you don't know what you can do or what can change your life. But one action can change your life. I know I've been here for a while. I know you guys you have all the engagement. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. And thank you. It's our tradition to present you with this glass sculpture. Um, well, here it is. <laughs> well, no, here it is. <laughs> I thought it was awful light when we had it. <laughs> so, uh, okay. okay. But uh, God bless you. And, thank uh, you. May he bless your mission. And we thank you from the bottom of our heart. And uh, thank you for being here, Palmer. Thank you, Dikembe. And... Um, I think our next Terry Third Thursday is on the uh, is it the seventeenth of February, and our guest is from the airport. Uh, uh, February John Crawford. Yep, will be here. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And let's thank so. Dikembe again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.